Alright, here we go. Take one. <laughs> What does recovery mean? And is it the same for everybody? You know, my idea of recovery needs to be a personal journey because without a personal interest by the individual, it means absolutely nothing. You know, we're all unique individuals with different likes, dislikes, goals, and dreams. So why would we have someone else tell us what that looks like for them? You know, some know my story as abstinence is absolutely the only possible way it's going to work for me. And because I want to be stable, happy, and secure, that only option fits within my goals. You know, periodically, I come across people and organizations that strive to identify each person as an individual and see what they can do to help them even though it may not even fit within the realm of their goals. You know, thinking outside the box requires unique minds. And I think today that we are going to meet a representative from an organization that seeks to offer this assistance. So I want you to stay tuned for Danella from Purpose of Recovery. Hello, everybody. This is Eric McCoy, and I am looking forward, as always, to getting high on High Wall Clean. You know, the greatest failure in the treatment industry stems from poor aftercare that is either provided and, in some cases, not provided at all. You know, clinicians fail their clients by not following our main goal of planning for their discharge the moment they walk in the door. You know, when discharge plans are done, most create a plan that has nothing to do with what the client actually plans on doing, but instead what the program wants them to do, right? 90 meetings in 90 days, you get a sponsor, go to this outpatient program. You know, this plan that's created by the clinician, and many times without the assistance of the client even, they then meet, they tell them what they're going to do. The client then signs it just to get out the door with as little conflict as possible and has no intention many times on doing any of those things. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear real quick. Just to be clear, this isn't everybody you know, across the board. There are great clinicians out there and the plan works for some people. But what about those that it doesn't? You know, Many programs will not learn from this because they identify the failure of the client because they just didn't follow through on what they were told that they were supposed to do. And I have a hard time putting all the responsibility on the client since it is our job as clinicians to always look out for the best interest of our client. What does that mean? Now I have an answer, which I'm gonna to get to in a second. But nothing excites me more than when I find an organization and specifically individuals in an organization that answer that question. You know, look out for the best interest of our client. And many believe it is to tell them what they need to do, right? What they outlined because it works for them. But works for who? You know, for me to tell a client in a professional environment what they need to do because it worked for me and what my goals and dreams are for them is unethical. 
whose life is it that we're talking about? Now, my guest today, Danella Secrely from Purpose of Recovery and Purpose of Recovery, which is currently located in Orange County, California, and they connect with local state and national recovery communities to support a long-term recovery for people. Their mission, as on their website, is to bridge the gap, highlight services, and to create a network of resources for individuals and families to heal, stabilize, and create growth in recovery. And I also understand, and I saw in there, that there's a recovery rally coming up on September 25th, which we are all going to learn about. <laughs> hey, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate that introduction. And I just want to give you my very short elevator speech because at the Purpose of Recovery, we feel like it's, ex well, we know it's extremely important that recovery messaging promotes the individual in their recovery, not promotes treatment necessarily. So I'm going to tell you my little speech here. My name is Donella Secrely. I am an ally of individuals and families impacted by substance use disorder and mental health concerns. Several years ago, I experienced a significant mental health issue. As I sought my own recovery through community-based resources, I discovered my purpose. My purpose is to nurture environments that build on individual strengths and promote long-term recovery for my mental health peers and substance use disorder peers. I choose to speak out about recovery so that others may know that recovery is real, hope is alive, and you too can thrive. That's my little spill, uh, because I am not a person that has substance use disorder in my past. I'm an ally and a friend, uh, but I understand the challenges that individuals with mental health face significantly. I also understand the comorbid nature of mental health and substance use and how those are bed partners. So I like to always make sure and uh, pre-qualify where I'm coming from as a person in recovery from a mental health issue, uh, but also being a friend and ally of those that have struggled with substance use. You know, when we had spoke before um, that I really appreciate people like you because, um, you know, a lot of people out there that have not been through it, they don't really even try to understand it, which is obviously something that you have worked very hard to do. And so the, one of the things that I, and I kind of said in the beginning that I really, you know, excites me about what you guys do is you guys are more in line with whatever works for you. Now we don't have this set guidelines, set rules that this is what you have to do or you're going to fail, mm -hmm. but you work with people wherever they are. Right. At, you know, at whatever moment there are. And I really appreciate that. And I like that about what you guys do, because I'm always looking for that for people. Right. We want to help them build on their personal strengths or find those strengths. Maybe they have buried them under their stash for so long that they've forgotten who they were before they uh, went down that road of addiction. And so really try to help them reconnect with their core of, of their personality, who they are, and, and maybe even um, decide on some parts that they want to remove from their lives, but adapt and adopt new ways of thinking and, and doing life, right? Um, what I do want to say about that is we find it really important that we, we want to communicate to the peers who seek services from the purpose of recovery that we will meet them where they are. And even if there's a setback in their life of any kind, that that does not negate their relationship with us. It actually strengthens, strengthens the relationship because then we are able to kind of peel back the layers of that onion and say, okay, what was the trip up? What caused this um, setback in your life? Whether, you know, it's deciding not to go to work that day or it is deciding to use a substance or maybe even start smoking cigarettes and they know that cigarettes are a problem for them because it will lead them to other things or perhaps the marijuana use or what have you. So we, we really talk about um, as you are moving along in life, we're here to support you as coaches, as mentors, as navigators, as peers. Uh, that understand where you're coming from. So that's been a really, a little bit of a difficult sell in Orange County. 
uh, that a lot of people are only familiar with particular programs that, you know, as soon as you've had a slip up in your life, you've got to get yourself right before you can come back into these doors. And that to me, I, we find that to be very detrimental where we're not going to um, eliminate your connection to us because of one moment of uh, a setback. So now are you speaking of like, uh, like 12 step programs? Are you talking about rehab facilities or all of the all above, above, right? All of the above. Um, to me, it's a real travesty that someone is kicked out of a program for a slip up where that should be a learning opportunity, a, a moment of, okay, what happened here? What do we need to do? What do you need to do? What do you think you need to do? Not mm -hmm. do what do we need to do or what do I need to tell you to do? but a learning opportunity without that opportunity, uh, what progress has been made? Yeah, that goes to the, you know, the failure of treatment programs and everybody out there that says addiction's a disease, right? And then if you relapse or you slip up, then we're going to punish you. You know, do we punish people for having diseases? <laughs> you know, do we punish the person who went to go get and ate the Snickers bar when they're a diabetic, an insulin dependent diabetic? Mm -hmm. Do we punish them? No, we get them help. Yeah. You'd hope so. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. So that's very important to us, meeting the individual where they are, being an open and accepting community. And, and so that kind of goes into harm reduction. That's mm -hmm. important to us. Uh, that we are open and, and, you know, <laughs> this, this gets into touchy territory, creating a community where someone who may have found their recovery, their sustained recovery through a 12 step program and someone who is in a medically assisted recovery program yes. and bringing them into the same space and being able to fellowship and socialize with one another and realize that we see one another as individuals on our own journeys and we're here to support each other. And that is, I think, probably one of our long-term goals, although it's not stated, but it's a value that we all hold pretty, pretty strongly. Yeah, we, so I worked at a, I was actually the director of a facility in Costa Mesa, this was years ago, and we had a, a MAP program there, medically assisted treatment, suboxone maintenance, you know, type program, along with the abstinence side. I mean, we had kind of all the, all the realms of it. But I used to love to do the a group with these clients within the MAP program. And I would usually do at least once or twice a week in the evening time, um, I would meet with these people. And this was the biggest conversation that we always got into was, you know, the self-help aspect of it, you know, and some of these people were serious about the recovery. I mean, they, you know, had a sponsor, they went to meetings, they did everything that everybody said they were supposed to do, but they were also told to lie. Right. right. And so they'd have a sponsor and they say, you know what, you're not clean until you get off this stuff and don't tell anybody. It's a rigorously honest program, as they say, but mm -hmm. we don't want real honesty <laughs> mm -hmm. because it's going to create problems. It's funny you bring that up because I was kind of in fun, we were actually working to create an alternative self-help type program. And we had actually written out a couple of pages sort of outlining a alternative, you know, type of program that was just to help everybody, anybody in need. I mean, you could have a gambling addiction and this is where All you, recovery, come, right? you know, um, any, anything that you, you had problems with depression, anxiety, you know, um, and that's what you guys are about too. So your recovery, when we say recovery are about, you know, um, mental disorders, um, all of addictions. So including behavioral addictions right. as well as chemical abuse. Um, and so you sit in that full realm. Um, how far do you guys go with the mental illness? We know that there are lots of resources for mental illness, um, really nationwide. I, I don't know why that is. Uh, there are far more resources for that than there are for substance use. So for us, it's meeting them again, meeting the peer where they are uh, in their concerns. None of our coaches are clinicians. We don't go to the clinical level. So they're all trained coaches. They go through a certificate program. Uh, they have to, of course, have continuing education units and ethics and ongoing training and motivational interviewing and all the things that make it 
uh, worthwhile for them to do this type of work. But we do draw the line on clinical work. Uh, when we have someone who is, it, it seems obvious that they are a danger to themselves or others, uh, we make referrals, obviously, and get a mental health clinician involved. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not really in a space to be able to assist them, but we're set, certainly in a space to walk with them. Sure. I will meet you at the mental health clinic. Would you like for me to get on the phone with the mental health clinic and you and help you with that phone call? So that's a coming alongside. That's more important than anything. You know, because even if they, you know, if they see a therapist, they see him for one hour, you know, they go see a doctor, they may see them once a week, twice, you know, maybe once a month, even sometimes. And so having that um, other assistance for more real life things, I think is probably more important than anything. Mm -hmm. Now your certificate program, is that something through you guys specifically or? Well, we do a lot of uh, practice work with our peer coaches but we have had all of our coaches trained either through CCAP or through the Recovery Institute out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone that we have on staff or that we're contracted with have either of those trainings. And they've also done the, the requisite hours to receive a certificate from CCAP. So that's the, the path we've taken. I don't know if you're familiar with SB 803, but the, the state mandate or state law yeah. that allows for some reimbursement of peer coaches or peer workers. And so we're in that pipeline to find out whether or not an independent nonprofit agency that is not clinical will be able to tap into those dollars. That's yet to be determined. Yeah, good luck on that. <laughs> I, exactly. But, you know, we can always hope, right? Hope is a lie. So well, the sad more, part, more to come. The sad part is, you know, and especially nowadays with COVID and everything that's been going on with this, the you know, substance abuse seems to have been become not a concern anymore. You know, oh, everybody's so, as you know, it's huge. Oh, hundred percent. It's, and it's gotten bigger. I mean, they were estimating 2020, we had, you know, over 90,000 deaths of sub of overdoses, you know, which is the highest ever. And I'm sure COVID played a little bit into it, but it seems like during this COVID time, it seems to be forgotten in a lot of realms because we're so focused on that. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, we definitely need to ma make sure that we maintain that focus on that. And that was uh, really, I want to kind of back up to the, the name of the organization, the purpose of recovery. Mm -hmm. It came out of a family's lived experience with an adult son who ended up in treatment with behavior and chemical addiction. And as a result, uh, the conversation that we started to have was, what helps someone maintain their recovery? How do they get there? And we really came to this place of, of awareness among us. And of course, I've got education to back me up and, and others did too in this conversation, but without purpose, if you don't have a purpose to move forward in life, something that you're focusing on, what's the point? And I have to tell you, I've enjoyed listening to your book in the last week and finding that purpose. You've talked, you have an entire chapter in there about finding purpose. Oh, you got right? my audio? And yes, I listened to the audio book. Yes, <laughs> I got to listen to your voice all those hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was so thrilled to hear that chapter about finding your purpose. And so we talked about what gives people purpose and meaning and drew out a wagon wheel and all the spokes of the different ways that we find purpose and meaning. And, and that's how the organization came to be. It's the purpose of recovery. What purpose am I basing my recovery on that will help sustain me even when I'm facing challenges? Because it's life. We all will face challenges. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's a reality. So that's where the, the name came out of. And, and when we sit down to work with peers, we start there. Unless they've got a burning issue, it's like, okay, let's talk about these 12 domains of life and kind of figure out what they want to work on, where they are in uh, not necessarily their sobriety, but where are they in life, mm -hmm. right? Because there's some people that, that come in for our services that, you know, they're like, I've got 25 years of sobriety, but I cannot seem to have a positive romantic relationship mm -hmm. or you know, I've got six years of sobriety and or in my recovery, and I just can't seem to move forward in my career. I'm kind of stuck. So, you know, it could be 
really either of those, or it could be, I am finally finished and I'm working on my sobriety right now. And I want to make sure that I have a strong foundation for moving forward. So. Yeah. That's what I, I ask clients all the time. You know, how do you stay clean and sober? And they always want to, oh, you know, they say all this stuff and I go, you just don't use. Right. I mean, that's the reality behind it, but I'm hoping you want something beyond that, you know, and that's kind of what you're talking about is, right. you know, I want to be happy, successful, stable, you know, uh, you know, the purpose thing is, is key. I mean, I, and I, I do talk about this in my book that, I mean, the people that succeed in recovery, that, that find that happiness, you know, they have a direction, they know where they're going, what they're doing, how they're going to get there, you know, and, uh, and that's what continues to move those people forward. Right. You know, I have a, obviously, if you've listened to my book, you understand that I had a very long drug history myself <laughs> and, uh, and, and numerous times in recovery and out of recovery. And it wasn't until I searched for a purpose you know, as you guys say, um, that things changed for me, that I had to have something I was reaching towards, reaching for. Um, and the start for it all was I just had to have an interest. And that was, that was my battle for a lot of years was I didn't have any interest in staying mm -hmm. clean, you know? Um, so I had to find a way to, to find that desire, find that interest, and then to figure out something I could spark that, you know? So Eric, what do you think was really the catalyst for finding that interest? You know, as the book's titled Pain, Failure, and Misery, right? And for me, I had to reach, I had to hit enough pain mm. to slap me in the face, you know? And it wasn't being in custody. It wasn't, you know, custody I'd done, you know, I've been arrested 10 times in my life and stuff. And, and that's, you know, where I finally reached that place where I started finding that, but I had to have that pain. I had to have that internal pain, you know, the freedom, you know, that I eventually found, I found in jail, <laughs> ironically enough, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's an inward thing. It's not anything mm -hmm. external. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have, a, I have a good friend of mine who's been in prison now for uh, coming up on eight years. And he's going to be getting out in a couple of months. I'm probably going to, um, he's going to probably move into one of my rooms here my house. Um, and, but we've talked a lot about that, you know, he's been in for eight years and, and, uh, and he's found that he found that freedom, you know, locked up in prison, uh -huh. you know, because it, it's not, it's not an external thing. It's an internal. Right. Right. So pain was pain is a uh, pain was my greatest friend. That was your catalyst. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. As you're talking about that, I'm reminded when I, you know, sharing my little 30 second spill that, that mental health issue it was extreme pain that led me to do something about it. I like, I can't live like this anymore. I have to do something different. Yeah. And it was out of that, that I found my purpose um, yep. too. So yeah, I, and I totally agree with that. I, people don't change unless there's enough pain. Right. You know, if things are just moving along, everything's good. Everything's wonderful. There's nothing for me to do. So I'm not going to do anything, you know? Um, and it's sad. It, it, you know, it, it, it sucks in some aspects because some of the greatest advocates out there that are fighting, you know, had to lose a kid, you know, uh, mm -hmm. as a drug overdose, you know, or had to have some horrific, horrible things happen to them. I wish we could figure out a way to, you know, get all those fighters and people doing this that don't have to suffer so bad. <laughs> well, you know, the only thing I've come up with, actually, it's not me, but it's other parents have said, lock the kids up until they're 25. You know, and that that prefrontal cortex is fully developed, <laughs> but I don't think that's the answer. <laughs> no, because they won't. They, there's a lot of lessons they need to learn. You know, with pain. Mm -hmm. and that's how you know. It's like the kid. You know, how does the kid know the stove's hot? They and touch it. Got to put their hand on it. Right. And then they never do it again. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, <Yes>. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> they do. Well, that's another issue. That is a mental health issue. We do yes. know somebody. We've got, we we've got a burner on our hands, right? <laughs> oh man. Scary stuff. Scary yeah. Stuff. Wow. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, and the thing I think that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, that, I mean, everybody's got problems. You know, everybody has problems. Everybody can work on something within mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, but again, it takes 
that, that's why I tell my clients all the time, you guys are the luckiest people in the world. You know, sitting in rehab, sitting in treatment, you guys are the luckiest people in the world because you get to work on things that other people don't. You've got right? time to work on it. I mean, how many, how many, how many sit down and say, I'm going to work on my confidence today. I'm going to work on my self-esteem today. People don't do that. You know, but people in rehab get an opportunity. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's true. Very true. It's a, um, a good analogy. At, at one point I wished I'm like, well, how can I get to a place where I, I would have that time to just work on self? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but yet I didn't have the addiction and I certainly wasn't in a space where I needed to go into a state hospital or anything like that. You know, I was, I was functional, mm-hmm. but in pain. Right. And what, were you, what were you dealing with, if you don't mind me asking? That- oh, okay. Well, here we go. I was dealing with, <laughs> my husband had been in grad school for six years and I had two young children. Mm. Okay. So it was a very challenging time. And I had moved to a new community where I did not have any social support. Mm. So you know how isolation impacts any kind of addiction or issue. So the social isolation was, was really... Um, extreme, the two young children. And my oldest child is, um, I knew that he was neurologically different from the time he was born, but we did not even do, we didn't do any medical intervention. I did a lot of my own research, reading, uh, working with him to make the environment as positive as it could be, meet him where he was. Okay. Mm -hmm. So right about the time my husband finishes this very long period of graduate school and all of the hours, he's a licensed professional counselor. So he was doing his clinical hours in the evenings and working a job and, you know, didn't see a whole lot of it for a while. He finishes that, gets a job in a mental health agency. We're ready to move on in life. And on his first day to go in to his new job, he stepped out, comes back in the house, and our son was having a grand mal seizure. Mm. And I had already been through the phases of, you know, the single parent kind of and trying to work through some real challenges of being alone. And then this child has a real strong medical condition, and we're we're now facing um, epilepsy, and it's time to go ahead and do all the diagnosis. So we end up with an autism diagnosis, ADHD, which I already knew, and the epilepsy and a couple of other things tacked on to it um, over the course of the next several months. But what happened is my husband also, and, and now I'm trying to, to help a child to make sure that he's safe and there's no physical damage to these grand mal seizures that now are starting to come on a real regular basis. Yeah. Okay, so I tapped out at this point. And um, my husband quickly transitioned to working in a local jail, which meant that he couldn't take a cell phone. I had no way of getting a hold of him. <laughs> and so I go from, you know, all these years of school to, oh, no longer available, working second and third shift. And I, my body shut down at this point. And I ended up in emergency um, with blood pressure, 200 over a hundred, several days in a row. And my body was, I had so much adrenaline pumping from constantly being on edge that I hadn't slept in about three weeks other than just an hour or two here or there. And I couldn't eat food because I felt nauseous all the time. And that's probably lack of sleep. So I was kind of in this mode of just shutting down physical. Um, and that's when, uh, one of my trips to the ER, they said, okay, you do have something going on here. We're going to give you some medicine. We're going to give you some, um, (laughs) going to give you some downers and some uppers. We're going to see how this goes. And we're going to give you a full dose that we would give somebody who's been doing this for a long time. But you can imagine how that, I had a psychotic episode, Wow. you know, cause I, that was something I wasn't used to at all. And I think, I don't know how many steps I walked over a three day period, but I walked constantly and I'm like, wow, this is what, you know, someone who's just got complete energy and, and, you know, understanding I had a lot of energy, but I had no, no nourishment in my body. I don't know how I was, well, you know, how I was moving. 
you're very familiar with that feeling. I just kept moving. And I'm like, this is so weird. How am I continuing to do this? So anyway, over the course of time, I, um, I ended up finding a recovery program that was very open and they had a grief group. And it was in that grief group where I was able to deal with my loss of dreams and aspirations for this child. I was able to come to terms with the fact that I never had found my community and grieve lost friendships and just, you know, process all of that. But it was also in that time where I realized, okay, I've got two very different children here. One of them is, has learning differences. The other one is extreme. Well, they're both very bright, but in different ways. And one with this learning difference and will probably be a, an amazing engineer someday. And this other one is a creative genius. And what am I going to do? So in that process, my purpose was to provide an educational environment where my children can thrive and other children like them can thrive. So I started a, a K-12 nonprofit school. Nice. That was, that really welcomed all children, um, which meant that we ended up having quite a few kids that were struggling with some mental health issues or um, identity issues that we're not comfortable in a, another educational environment. So it was a really fruitful time for myself and my children and our whole family. Um, and it was out of that, that I finished my degree, my master's, uh, in social work. And I started by focusing on children. And then I focused, I'm like, well, I got all that part figured out. I got all that figured out in my undergrad. I'm going to focus on families. Well, kind of got that figured out. So I'm going to switch over here to mental health and substance use. And uh, when I finished my program in mental health and substance use, I said, okay, it's time for me to go work in this field. I feel so passionate about this. I've had lost too many friends. I've seen too many families destroyed. I'm going to do something. So I, I told the school staff on a Thursday, I said, listen, I'm going to be resigning. I don't know how much longer I'll be here, but we need to identify a, a new director of the school. And I'm going to go do this thing and support people in recovery, but I don't know how long before I get there because I got to figure out how to fund it or what I'm going to do. So that was on a, a Saturday. On Wednesday, I had an email from a woman I worked for 25 years ago in Irvine. She said, Miss D, where are your passions leading you next year? Wow, that's, that's a really loaded question coming from her. <laughs> I said, well, I've told my staff at the school I'm going to resign and I'm going to do something with recovery. She said, well, I want to fund that. Let's talk. Wow. See, so you proved the point that, you know, what can sometimes seem to be the worst thing in the world happening to you can turn out to be the greatest gift that you ever received. Absolutely. Absolutely. I see that day after day after day with people. Um, I see it in people that sometimes they don't see it in themselves, but, you know, but when we're able to eventually see that, mm -hmm. then sometimes that's where we can find our purpose. Right. You know, that's where our purpose can come from. Oh, I think it's um, a beautiful thing that I've been able to witness others now. I mean, we we're a very young organization, but you know, I, in, in networking, I do a lot of networking. I was a business person in marketing and I'm, that's, I'm, I love, it. you know, I love getting out there and meeting people and finding out who they are, what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. So in networking and in trying to meet people across the nation, really, and starting the purpose of recovery, I wanted to see what other organizations were doing and what was happening in, in different parts of the world or country. And I ended up in a um, action planning for life meeting one day. And there was a, a gentleman that was in that group and he starts talking. I thought, I need to meet this guy. And he was um, in the process of developing his purpose and knowing that he wanted to do something in and around the recovery community based on his lived experience, his three DUIs and his felony. Yeah. And he came out of the gaming industry, had a very successful career in there. Uh, made a bunch of money and uh, drank all of it. Mm. So here we end up in the same room and I said, Hey, let's, let's talk after this meeting. And it just so happened that he had just finished the peer coach training in another state the Friday before. Mm. And he said, I'm going to be looking for a job. 
I said, well, you're a business developer. Let's talk about this. And just seeing how these things just fit together so well and, and finding this individual that is leading the peer services as the director of peer services for our organization out of his lived experience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I don't think I ever would have met him in any other circumstance, you know, just it's serendipity the way that some of these connections have come about. In uh, March of 2020, right before everything shuts down for COVID, I was planning on going over to the Alana, Anaheim Alana Clubhouse because I was having a hard time finding community programs, right? There's a lot of 12-step stuff, but I couldn't find anything independent. I thought, well, I know that the Alana Clubhouse in Anaheim is heavily populated. They've got a lot of programs. It seems really active. I'm going to just go find out who can I, you know, is there anybody here interested in doing more? And I didn't make it because of coronavirus. So, you know, they shut down. I went home, worked on my stuff, whatever. Just so happens that about three months later, talking with a really good friend of mine who has been in recovery for 26 years, she knows the director over there at the Anaheim Alana Clubhouse. And I just had heard on another Zoom call, you know, our entire lives revolved around Zoom there for a long time, um, that there's this new organization called Recovery Road, and it's opening up in Anaheim. Well, it just so happens that this director of the Alana Club is doing both. She's directing Recovery Road, and she's directing the Alana Club, and all these things are happening in this recovery community. If we had had that conversation, I think she would have been, I would have overwhelmed her in March with my information and my excitement, but she walked her journey over those three months and realized we need a recovery center that's open to everybody in this community that anyone can come to for resources. And she went out and created it. Mm -hmm. So she creates this recovery community center and we're creating a recovery community organization. And at the same time, there's the Orange County Recovery Collaborative that's going on and meeting once a month. And it's just that serendipity and that connectedness and that networking, and it's happened. Yeah. There is a real change happening in our community. Yeah, Orange County has been has a huge recovery community, you know, and it has for a long time. Um, a lot of cities hate them too, you know, right? The treatment programs. <laughs> <laughs> I was the director of a program in Newport Beach uh, years ago that had to go through all of that chaos within the city of getting these special permits and public hearings and, you know, hearing people tell you how horrible you are and how bad you are as addicts. And, you know, it was sad because you almost, I, I sat through some of these hearings and I almost literally felt like, damn, I like almost feel bad for doing what I do, <laughs> you know, the way this was coming out. But um, that's amazing. That's fantastic. You know that that um, this, this thing's really growing because yeah, Orange County needs it. Really needs it. There's a lot of treatment, and there are a lot of twelve step programs. Yes. But there's not a whole lot of aftercare. Yes. Like you start off at the top of the hour. There's not a lot of support for individuals once they've left that door. Um, they can get to a meeting, but like you said, not everybody. It feels like they can connect to that. That was Uncle Joe's program. That's not my program. You know, I don't I don't connect to that. What are we going to do to meet the need of that individual? Well, that was always the the arguments that I had with uh, with a lot of clinicians specifically, you know, because, again, going back to the discharge planning, you know, that, oh, we're going to have you go 90 meetings, 90 days, get a sponsor, do all this kind of stuff. Um, And they never really sit down and say, are you going to do this? Hmm. You know, is this something you're even willing to do? Mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of these clinicians for a lot of years had no other alternatives, you know, and that's where we really have this thinking outside the box, but there's all kinds of options. There's all kinds of different things that people can do to find the things that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked before about, and I really like it, that harm reduction aspect, you know, I mean, you could work with somebody that is smoking, smoking weed and, and, you know, still trying to figure out, you know, um, what they can do, you know, you'll, you know, work with people within the MAT program, medically assisted treatment, you know, um, I'm assuming methadone, you know, clients, things, you know, um, probably not people slamming heroin, but. Probably not. (laughs) However, 
<laughs> well, let's not go. To, we won't get into that conversation. You never know. That will get political. <laughs> we were talking before about, you know, the like the safe houses, you know, in Canada and things like that. And yes. And how um, I think I think personally, we need to do something like that. You know, because there's so many people that are under the bridges in the, you know, shack somewhere that aren't coming out that we're never going to find. The only time mm-hmm. we'll find them is when they the coroner picks them up. Right. You know, right. but what if we opened up something where people felt safe to come out, mm-hmm. you know, given, you know, clean needles and, and that, that concept of what they did up there was they found that, you know, if, you know, that, that moment of the decision for somebody to get clean is not long. Right. You know, it's a moment. It's literally mm-hmm. a moment. You go, mm-hmm. man, maybe I should really do something. Mm-hmm. All right. Never mind. <laughs> you know, and it's gone. Yeah. But if you're in a place or if you're talking to somebody or if you have that, you know, you're in the right time, you know, right moment, the right time, mm-hmm. they may make a decision and you got, and if you got something you can go to, let's do it. So I just want to give a little plug. I don't know much information about it, but it came up in a meeting earlier today. Volunteers of America in Southern California, they have some new funding and they have a program where they will immediately go get somebody into housing and pro- provide them with what they need as they're getting to treatment. Hmm. And that apparently is just rolled out um, maybe this month. I'm not sure how soon, uh, but it is a very new program. So I might suggest to any of your viewers, if, if that's something to they would need to know about, to maybe have that information in their back pocket. Absolutely. So that's pretty new. So now you have a, an event coming up. We do. Yes. What is that about? Yeah, it is the Recovery Connection Rally. It is a countywide rally that we are producing. But our focus here is to get the entire community involved. So there are many community partners uh, that are sponsoring space at this event. So they'll be there with a table, their information. Uh, There are hospitals, treatment centers, government agencies, nonprofits, for profits, a little bit of everything. Hmm. And the intent here is to open this up to the entire community so that individuals and families that are seeking recovery or are in recovery, or perhaps they've been many, many years of recovery, but it's a time to come out, share their stories and find out what, what does our landscape look like today? We've come through COVID, what's available? Um, How do I connect? How do I network? We'll have speakers in the morning and afternoon. Uh, many of the community sponsors will come up to the stage and give a little spill about what it is that they do. The anonymous band will be performing and we're serving lunch. So it's, I mean, there's food, there's music, uh, there's volleyball, there's a bounce house. Nice. And yeah, so it, it's, it's an event that is open to the whole family and it's been so well received. We're very excited about all the partnerships. I know we're going to max out. That's absolutely for certain at this point. So you're going to be there. Oh yeah. I'll be there. Of course. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll pop in and see you. That'd be great. Yeah. So, so far I'm the person that's supposed to be holding the microphone, but maybe if I found another MC somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, we're, um, I will definitely be there and I'll make sure that you've got the information so you can stop on by. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, because I saw it on I saw it on your website, and uh, yeah, I'd definitely be very interested in checking it out. You know, like I said, I love what you guys do. I love, I love the the purpose behind what you guys are doing. Um, it's not telling people what to do, but helping them get to where they want to go in life. That's right. All persons that are, and you know, if you're in education right now, or going to school for psychology, or chemical dependency counseling, or social work, whatever the case is. All best practices are meet the person where they are. Let's make this person-centered, strength-based, right? Reducing stigma. And I don't know how long it's going to take for that information to filter through all of society. I'm afraid it's going to be a really long time, but that's best practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Let me ask you a question. Is there something that I haven't asked you that you'd like to say? um, Well, you went out to our website. Tportpor.org. Uh, we do have some online uh, group meetings that are available. Anyone can log in at any time. We've got a community coaching call that's Monday at lunchtime. So someone says, hey, I, I, I'd like to maybe see what you guys would say about 
this particular issue in my life. Anyone's welcome to come into that space. Of course, it's an open forum. So what stays in the room or what's said in the room stays in the room. However, you've got to know that there will be other people. It's not a one-on-one coaching call. Uh, we also have a DUI support uh, group that meets on Tuesday nights. And it's that particular announcement's been picked up and shared over and over throughout California on Facebook. So we've got people that are welcome to join from anywhere, actually anywhere in the country. If you've got Zoom, you can log in. So it's not it's not relegated just to people in Southern California. Um, so, you know, anyone can go out to the website, take a look at that. But moving forward, what I would want to also say is um, we are modeled after the National Advocacy Group of Faces and Voices of Recovery. Mm. There are many RCO, recovery community organizations that are all up and down the Eastern seaboard uh, that are very doing very, very good work uh, in those communities. And, and many of them are now actually funded by city or county governments, maybe in some cases by state. So we know that that's a little bit of a late start coming to California or coming to the West Coast, this movement of recovery community organizations that hold the values that we hold. But our goal is to have a solid model in Orange County that we then can replicate into other parts of Southern California. So you guys are affiliated with, with Faces and Voices of Recovery? We are a member partner. Okay. Um, so we're part of the Association of Recovery Community Organizations that's run by Faces and Voices of Recovery. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I loved, um, uh, I'd actually been at a meeting uh, way back where they had a representative had come out to, to Orange County. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I heard him say, and I love what he said. And he said, you know, that like 40% of people in recovery have never gone to rehab nor a 12 step program through statistics. And I love that because again, it just shows you that there's a lot of ways to do this. Now mm-hmm. I'd always love to hear from some of those people. How'd you do it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> which some of those people you never hear from, but it would be, you know, it'd be insightful, but um, but yeah, there's all kinds of ways that we can, do you know, Jody Barber? Um, I know of Jody Barber. I haven't okay. met in person. Yeah. yeah. She's a fantastic lady. I've had her on my show and um, we, I've done a lot of stuff with her, but um, well, if you were to say something to somebody out there that is struggling, what would you tell them? You're not alone. There are others that struggle. And we have people that have been down that path that just love to talk to you and listen to you. I think the more important thing is listening. That is the key, you know. That's mm-hmm. the other thing that I think, um, again, so many counselors, therapists, all of them, that they really fail to do is just listen. Mm-hmm. You know, some of these people, that's all they need is just to be heard. They just want to be heard. You know, and I, I spend so much time with that with, with clients and, and I'll just let them talk. You know, and I'll listen to what they're saying, you know, Mm -hmm. try to listen to things they're saying and things they're not saying. (laughs) Right. Read all that body language. Yep. So, hey, I want to thank you so much for coming on here. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate the invitation. This has been a really neat conversation. Absolutely. And again, like I said, I think you guys, uh, what you guys are doing is fantastic. We need a lot more of it. Um, You know, we need, I know you guys here in Orange County, we need this stuff to just spread out through, through the country too. (laughs) <laughs> well, and if you have any listeners that are interested in getting involved in this movement, I, I hope that they'll contact us because we'd like to help facilitate that. Great. All right, everybody. I want to thank everybody again for tuning into another episode of High Wall Clean. And as I always say, keep getting high, but let's do it clean. I'll see you soon. Thanks. Show